morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is this finds you. I appreciate you finding the time to find me. I'm your host of the Bow Body Show, Ricky Rains. Uh, as you notice, I am not with my co-host today. Um, Alex had a little bit of maybe duty as a as a new dad. Um, so he is taking care of a little bit more important business. But don't worry, that doesn't mean that you're sitting here stuck with me, having to listen to me talk for the next however long it is that you're planning on listening. Actually, it's the exact opposite. I have an incredible guest tonight on the show. Um, I am a huge fan of, of this guy's work. Uh, we're going to get into exactly what that work is, but I'm going to tell you right now, man, it is some batshit crazy stuff, and I mean that in the best possible way. Um, so without further ado, let me go ahead and bring up our guest, Mr. Matt Waldman of the Rookie Scout Portfolio. Matt Waldman, how you doing, man? I'm doing great, Ricky, and you know, I, I don't know. I don't think anybody would have a problem listening to you talk. You got some pipes on you, my man. You know, that's really the whole reason all this is even going, right? Is that people have told me my whole life I got a radio voice. And I thought they were just being nice to call me ugly. But it turns out that they actually might have been telling the truth. <laughs> <laughs> nah, man. It, it, it works well on you, man. It works well on you. So, Thank so, you, man. Nice. Yeah. Uh, um, so, Matt, I know a lot about you. Um, I've been a subscriber to your publication for a little while now. Um but for those that don't, can you kind of give just a basic background of what the RSP is and what all it entails? Sure. I've been doing this for 19 years. It's the 19th year the RSP has been in publication. And it is a really a scouting analysis publication on quarterback, running back, wide receiver, and tight end. That's all I focus on. And I do a pre-draft version and a post-draft version. And the reason I do that is that I came from an operations quality management perspective where I wanted to look at the NFL draft from an unvarnished perspective. I didn't want to w deal with draft capital. I didn't want to deal with fantasy or guessing what round the guys were in. I just wanted to evaluate talent. So that's what I do. I do it in a really transparent way that's in a lot of details, probably one of the most comprehensive things you'll see. The RSP is one of the two most purchased independent draft guides by draft, um, by NFL types, according to folks like Alex Brown, who I often bring up because he tells me that on a regular basis. He works at <laughs> Ole Miss. He was the recruiting director at SMU and before that Rice in Houston. So he he meets with these guys on a regular basis. And right. you know, certainly I've I've had some scouts come through who who buy my work and some other folks and they tell me who's bought that. But that's that's essentially what it is. So it's a draft guide devoted to those four positions yeah. with a fantasy element post draft that I do. Um, and I've been writing at footballguys.com since 2009 and fantasy football since 2003, but it's steeped in real football with the RSP. Yeah. You know, you bring up a, a cool point that actually kind of segues into something I wanted to bring up that I found so interesting. And it's, you said that, you know, scouts have put or bought your product and, and read your publication and things like that. Cause you've been hesitant prior to, I don't know when it was that you finally accepted it, but you were very hesitant to call yourself a scout just out of respect for the for the people that were in the profession working for professional teams and things like that when did you what like how long did it take for you to get comfortable and say all right look man i'm i'm giving myself hell and spending all this time and i'm putting out good work so let me go ahead and give myself the title probably after my buddy ryan riddle who played in the league for a number of teams and is the cal's um Cal's um, single season sack rec, um, leader who played with Marshawn and, and Aaron Rodgers. He was just like, dude, you're a scout. We, you need to stop this. <laughs> like, you, you know, so, and even then, I think I waited another five years. So, probably a good 10, 10 to 12 years into it, I hesitantly yeah. started referring to myself as independent scout. And I think part of it is, is that I don't interview players, I don't yeah. look into their background, I don't work for a team. But I'm okay with saying I'm an independent evaluator or an independent scout because that's that's generally what I do. Yeah, and you know if you if you do like a combo like I do because I'm just a complete sicko for football and for fantasy and, and draft and all that kind of stuff. If you do a nice combination of you and Dane Brugler's the beast, you get all that background, you get all that kind of like you know uh, work for the big media type of perspective, right? And then you kind of go and you get into yours, and you've just got data man i mean it is incredible what you've got going in there i think this year you have what around 1200 pages there's no pictures there's no kinds of like fluffer or anything like that it is just straight up data you said it takes 18 months to put all that together 
I'd say pretty much, yeah, because I'm doing it mostly year round. And so, you know, I'm watching film, but I want to show everyone how I watch film, how I define everything, what my checklists look like, how I define the points in that, what the ways that I score players so that you can, if you wanted to do it yourself, you could. When my yeah. wife used to joke, like, you don't want to share everything with everybody. What I said, if somebody decides they're going to do this, I'm going to take them out for a beer because I'm going to pick right. them on what they've learned <laughs> and approach because it's, it's not about the, what I do. It's about mm -hmm. the effort that goes into it. And if, and if a team were to adopt doing it, they'd still have to learn how to manage it. And that's something 100%. that I had expertise in doing with teams. I just decided this would be fun for football and I just wanted to do it by myself and I didn't want to scale it and try and sell it. I just wanted to try and grow the process and get better at it. So we, I joke that I joke that Dane Brugler's when he named his, the beast, he can be King Kong. I'll be Godzilla. I'll <laughs> not out of the depths of the ocean. Cause my stuff goes really deep where his has a lot of breadth. You know, it does. I love that, man. That's terrific. That's a perfect way to put it. One last thing before we get into some actual football talk. You also do an incredible thing where you save 10% of every sale um, for the RSP each year, and you put it off to the side until the RSP has reached its annual goal of donating $5,000 to Darkness to Light, which is to combat sexual abuse for children. Um, that's just commendable to, to begin with, um, but I, I think that it's really cool to infuse something that matters to you when you are giving a whole bunch of data and information to people that that's what matters to them, right? Like football is what they came here for, but you're going to benefit something way bigger than football by doing this work. So I wanted to commend you on that, man. That's awesome. I appreciate that. And yeah, I mean, it's technically what I do now is I think it used to be 5% what I did. Mm -hmm. And then, and then now it's just more like I capped it at five and we've given over, um, S over $65,000 since 2012, wow. around the, the whole Penn State scandal. And details work with, um, you know, Penn State, Michigan State, a lot of areas where individuals maybe really missed the boat when it came to how to work with victims and how to approach reports of abuse so that they didn't further traumatize people who... Mm -hmm. We're accusing people of that. So yeah, I mean, it's a. I'm I'm very happy that we have a, a a following a customer base who's enthusiastic about us being you know giving to that cause, and sure. they've certainly been a great um, organization in terms. Of, if you look on Charity Navigator, they've usually scored a 100 on that, and over the several years, they do a good job of how they use the money. Um, and it's a you know, like I said, it's a worthwhile cause. It's a hard cause. People don't want to talk about that yeah. cause more than anything because it's a very taboo thing. But it's so sure. unfortunately common, um, you know that and and how it impacts lives with people, it, you know, with so many other things that people end up having issues with. Yeah, oftentimes the root issue is this one. And right. that's the one no one wants to talk about. People want to talk about alcoholism and drug abuse and, and physical the abuse. Easy and all topics. Sorts, all the right. easy topics. But yeah. One that's the root is oftentimes this one. So, yeah, I mean, and that's the thing. So, you know, we're appreciative and I appreciate you calling that out. If anything on the show, whether you get the RSP or not, after we have this right. conversation, go to ddl.org and donate to them. You know, absolutely. I mean, they're awesome. And it's and it's a it is a critical and relevant thing too because you talk about like youth sports and stuff like that. I mean, we're talking about kids that are around other people, and there's a lot of vetting, right? Like I'm I'm in my inaugural year as a uh, coach for a flag football team here in Charlotte. Um, for my son's team, he's six years old, so these are young kids, and you got to go through the background check and all that stuff. But man, there's still a lot of adults around these kids, and you just never know if somebody's feeling uncomfortable. So I think what you touched on is such an important thing about making it a comfortable thing, not making it seem like somebody else is doing something wrong for something wrong being done to them. So I really appreciate the perspective on that, man. And I just think that it's a perfect cause to, to tie all this stuff into it. Thanks for calling it out. Of course. Um, all right. So let's talk a little bit about the RSP. Um, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I don't know how much you're planning on giving me today. I'm going to take as much as you have. So <laughs> you're going to have to like wave a white flag, man, when you're ready okay. to get out of here. <laughs> Sounds fun. Um, so first off, when you talk about your film breakdown process, right, you have like a four point framework that you mentioned in the RSP. Um, I want to kind of touch on those first, just to kind of give people a little bit of context, if I can, on what it is that you do when you're breaking down your film, because film is king for you. 
Um, you have, does the player demonstrate consistently sound techniques and decisions in game day situations? Does the film provide examples that support or differ from the combine results? Does the player transfer his physical skills to the football field? And what is the player's comfort level with physical contact? How did you kind of come to those four points as being the basis of your film evaluation? Well, I think part of it was just from, you know, well, part of it was naivete probably from 19 years ago. And it's oh, yeah. interesting with that. I'll add an, an extra one to it that kind of ties the room together with all of it in a minute. But I think more than anything is that you football is a conceptual sport. It's an athletic sport. It's also there's theory and there's technique with all those things. So you kind of have to tie everything together. So you're looking for, you're looking for players to, and a lot of it's reading coaches, you know, coaches like yeah. Bill Parcells and, and Bill Walsh and, and, and guys who talk about, look, you need to have a level of physical and mental toughness to play the game. And it needs to be exhibited on the field. Um, you know, we can tell narratives all day long about what, what kid had to walk up both ways, you know, the hill both yeah. ways in the snow yeah. and all that kind of thing. But that's fine. They're tough in life. Are they tough on the football field? It's a, it yeah. can be a different thing sometimes. Sometimes it overlaps. So there are things like that. But really what it comes down to me is that scouting is about taking the physical, um, the technical, the conceptual, and the intuitive skills that are required to play football and to be able to create um, solutions that put themselves or put their teammates in position to make positive plays. Doesn't mean that they actually get the result. It just right. means that they've set themselves or other people up for good outcomes to happen if they can make it happen. So as a result of that, you can be a Matt Forte way back in the day who Everybody yeah. on LSU outlifted him, outlifted right. you know his team, but he and couldn't gain many yards against LSU's national championship caliber defense. But he'd still score well because he did those things that I just said. He put himself mm -hmm. in position to make good plays, or put his teammates in position to make good plays, so that it, good outcomes could could happen, even if they don't. And that's happened repeatedly, and I think that's what good scouting is is that you can highlight the lay of the land of how they can go about doing that, where they don't always go about doing it, where they could improve, mm -hmm. and where they may struggle in those areas to improve. Because it's really about what value a player brings to the organization, not whether you got the player right being number one or number five sure. or number 15. Right. Yeah, it's not about the rankings. It's, it's you're trying to figure out what does this player bring to a football team when he's drafted, right? Yeah. Um, and you also, you, you credit Joe Thomas and Ron Wolf um, as a couple of the inspirations for, for that film is king, right? Why it's the best evaluator. Um, I love the mention of like Fran Tarkenton specifically, right? Because that's the small diminutive quarterback. And here in Carolina, we've got a little bit of that going on here um, where there was a lot of doubts about Bryce Young's physical capacity to play the position. There, there was not a lot of questions about what was between the ears, right? Everyone knew that he was a smart dude. Everyone knew that he had a quick processing. Um, but as far as like his arm strength and his being able to see over the line, all those things, it was a real big question mark. And you, and you talk about the drafting of Fran, Tar of Fran Tarkenton, and then he goes into Larry Sanka, who's a guy that, you know, hey, he was too slow to be a productive NFL runner. I love it because there's this seven degrees of Kevin Bacon thing going on for me when I read those, right? I think of Bryce Young. And then I think of all the other guys, all the other prospects through the years that I've been following draft stuff. It's not about them being can't do guys. It's look at what these guys can do, right? And this time last year, I'm going to give you another big old pat on the back here. My favorite Waldmanism, if you will, was the wise coaches choose to fit scheme to quarterback and not quarterback to scheme. I just think that there's something that really ties together, man, with the way that you do this. And I'm sure that's very intentional. I know that that's probably the way you set out to do, but it works, man. Um, looking at Bryce Young, if I can, you had him, I, I believe in the RSP this year, you had him and, and you do this thing where you rank like your last three years of prospects, right? I believe you had him at six, maybe, between those quarterbacks. 
Okay. Did you see anything from Bryce last year on the field that gives you reason to believe that there's some corrective coaching that's going to have to happen with him? Or is he still kind of that moldable, you know, rookie that just had a shit situation in his rookie year? I'd say it's B, not A. Yeah, yeah I think it's the latter. I mean, when you when you're off when your interior offensive line needs work and it needed to be addressed and it, and mm-hmm. they're trying to address that, you can see. And you have, you know, you you had one veteran receiver, and yeah. then the rest were young guys. It's nice to grow with your receivers. You know, they say that's a common phrase you hear the draft community talk about with Jordan Love because, you know, they praise that football community praise that. But let's remember something. Jordan Love sat on the bench for a number of years to get his shit together mm-hmm. before he could then play with young receivers. He already had his stuff together. His footwork was finally where it needed to be. He had he wasn't having to overthink about basic skill sets and deal with a pass rush and deal with new variations of defensive coverages and savvier defenders who could trick you compared right. to what he was doing at Utah State, where he would get into quicksand very often and mm-hmm. it would look awful at times. And and it was so good that he got that time. Because if he was trying to learn all those things that he didn't know at Utah State with three receivers who played less than a than a year. Rookie year in the NFL. Yeah, forget that. That's going right. to be utter disaster. So we can talk about the genius of the Packers, but the and the, and what they did, and I commend them for. It, but it started first with what they they ha- having the foresight to say we're going to draft this kid early and we're going to mm-hmm. sit him because he's not ready. Now, right. with Carolina, they had Thielen, and that was it. Really, yep. uh, as a as a guy who was could provide an additional level of mentorship and coaching on the field and, and a different set of eyes. And he's yep. quite valuable, but yeah, to me, everything you saw with young, if you look at something and you say, Hey, the scouting reports I saw everywhere, didn't say this about him. And he was failing here. Let's remember something. Quarterback is a performance position. It's a stage mm-hmm. position. This is one of the things I like to say a lot. It's not a science. Okay. Yeah. So, when you get good performers and you put them in an, in an environment with advanced performers around them who are all great, you're going to level up faster. If you put they put you in a situation where the performers are up and down at the very best or bad, then now you're starting to have to deal with things that you haven't had to deal with for a long time. And now you're questioning everything. So right. I think... I think he's still a guy you got to be open minded about. And as long as they're addressing what they need to up front, I think you're going to see ad- advancements in his game and development in his game this year. I love to hear that. Thank you so much. Because you know what, man? We get in a lot of conversations, uh, football fans in general, when you have like a big fan base and you have like the social media stuff. You always end up in these huge debates, right? And you get some people that just want to be right about what they said about a prospect as opposed to actually like wanting to see if there's more room to develop and grow and and progress. And a lot of fans, for some reason, seem to think, hey, it's over for Bryce. Like that last year showed how bad he was. It was a historically terrible year. But I saw a lot of stuff on film, too, with Bryce that was super encouraging, man. Like really tight window throws. He attacked the middle of the field pretty damn well. Um, and I thought that that was a, uh, an area where there were some question marks coming in, right? Like his, his statistics would show that he was good at it, but people thought that the physical composition and in the NFL would lead to him having struggles with that, not having the arm strength, not being able to see over the line. I thought he looked really good there. Um, now we come into this year's draft, right? And we've got what is being hyped up as one of the all time deep wide receiver classes. That's what it is being heralded as. First off, let me get your opinion on that. Do you see this draft class in that kind of regard? If if we talk about it as the potential versus the reality and just right. deal with the potential right now, absolutely, it's going to rival the 2014 class where we had Sammy Watkins and, and um, Cooks and Brandon Cooks, Mike Evans. Um, I believe Odell Beckham Jr. was a part of that. So was Devontae Adams. You know, there's a there were a lot of good players that yeah. were among that group that did work out. Now, 
Will that be the reality? Probably not. You know, injuries, right. immaturity, bad system mm -hmm. fits, all sorts of things happen. But I would say overall, this is the strongest group I've evaluated pre-draft in at least seven to eight years. Um, wow. I have guys, I have more guys who came up with immediate starter grades within their first one to three years in the league than I've ever done. Um, I'm mean, a lot of guys who are ranked outside my, there's guys ranked outside my top seven to eight who would be in the top three to four of last year's class in terms of score. So yes, this is a great class. And the good part of this is Bryce Young's been through some shit. They're getting yeah. the offensive line a little bit better. And to add to your point about seeing between seeing over the line, every quarterback who actually has played a decent amount of football will tell you, mm -hmm. you see between the linemen, between, you yeah. don't see over the linemen. Yeah, and it's so windows. it's windows. And so yeah. Bryce Young was always good with that. And, you know, to me, I mean, I don't know. I've always, you talked about Fran Tarkin and I worked at football outsiders for a while. And the mm -hmm. first thing football guy, football outsiders had was something called the Lewin career forecast. And it was this like metric that they did that they were experimenting with to say this, we hope this could become something predictive about which quarterbacks are going to work out. And it was the Andrew Luck, you know, Robert Griffin, everybody was looking at them and they were high on the scale. And then there was this kid, Russell Wilson, who was higher than anybody, but they mm. put an asterisk on. Him. And then I said, so for my first article, because they asked me if I would study tape and do that. And I did that for, I think, three years maybe with them. And then they kept the futures column that I called it. And they, have some, they had someone else doing it before they became defunct. And I said, as a first column, can I poke fun at your Lewin index a little bit and call it and say I'm studying the asterisk? Because I think <laughs> Russell Wilson could be a starter in this league. I didn't think yeah. he would be that good that quick and get that opportunity. But sure. he was. But that's part of the thing is that there's always been a history of smaller quarterbacks, and it's not about seeing. It's you know, it's about whether you're willing to step up in the pocket and right. whether you can see the field and anticipate and process fast. And there, the NFL is starting to realize that a little bit. Yep. And, and and so that'll take me to this next part of the anticipation is something with Bryce, right? He's an anticipatory thrower. So when I look at this receiver class, um, I'm looking for receivers that will kind of work with that skill set, right? Um, and, and and Dave Canales, new head coach here in Carolina, he's he's alluded to the emphasis that he wants on alignment, versatility, um, guys that can win at any of the different positions. So that's another thing that is on my checklist, right, of what I'm looking for when I'm looking at these prospects. Um, there's a couple guys that you had high that I also have very high. Um, Xavier Worthy, you have as your wide receiver four. I have Xavier as my wide receiver five. Um, I got a couple graphics here. I took a little bit of time nice. and did some stuff up for us. Um, Xavier Worthy is a guy that I'm not sure if he lasts until 33. Um, it, it's kind of hard to predict where teams are going to like him. He's got that slight frame. But man, he's got some game changing speed. Like he is just, and he's sharp with his route running. What do you like about Xavier Worthy that made you put him that high in this kind of class? Well, I mean, I think more than anything is that you see that he's a pretty versatile route runner and mm -hmm. he can earn separation at the line of scrimmage, both with his speed and also with some technical ability, which is going to be important. You're going to have to get off press coverage and use your footwork and your hand counters to do that. And he's got some promising work there. Um, and he works in the middle of the field. He's not just a, a deep vertical guy. He's not Ted Ginn, okay, yeah. where, you know, Ted would clap attack balls. And, and he had a long career. He was a great return specialist and a very good vertical threat. But mm -hmm. that was mainly it. Occasionally you get a dig route out of him. You know, but it wasn't okay. that wasn't his strength. Yeah. Xavier Worthy's the type of guy that more like the comps you see on the screen there with Isaac mm -hmm. Bruce and Deshaun Jackson, he can work the middle, he can make the tough plays. And while you see some areas where he juggles the ball a little bit or he's dropped some passes, it's not on the level of even someone say like Cortland Sutton, who's a good NFL starter. He's yeah. like the I don't know, you know, you, you think about, you know, Carolina's a basketball town. My wife's from Carolina, you know, from North Carolina. So, you know, if you're if you're a, a basketball person, you think of like that, you think of that 
small forward who has to be fed the ball a lot and mm-hmm. they're going to yep. miss their share of shots, but they're going to make them. Cortland Sutton's that kind of pass catcher. He clap attacks a lot of balls. He shouldn't. And you know, if you feed him enough, he's going to make plays, you but you have to feed him. Yeah. yeah. I don't think Xavier Worthy's as, as um bad as that. If I'm going to use bad as a relative sure, term, right? He, but he is tough and he's more physical than you expect in, in terms of being able to run yes, after man. the catch. And he yeah. bowls over guys when he has the ball sometimes, man. Like, I see yeah. him seek out that contact to finish a play. Yeah, and I think if you're in the secondary, that's okay with certain scenarios. I mean, certainly right. in the NFL, he's going to get his welcome on that and may oh, yeah. have to tailor that back a bit. But the fact that he uses good pad level, he accelerates mm-hmm. into the contact, that's the important part. And, and he has because, the mindset, right, that he doesn't yes. mind and he doesn't shy away from it. That was one of your big points. Yeah, and so you're looking at – a physical player who knows when to be physical, who can take that contact when he needs to and exhibits good techniques and concepts when doing so. So for me, I see him as much more of a complete receiver than just a future field stretcher for a team that's going to use him in a two-dimensional aspect, which is basically, you know, short routes and long routes. He's a guy who can give you that important intermediate facet that really ties everything together. That's where you win, right, in the league, is that intermediate. That's how you become a, a high-volume kind of target. Um, and speaking of that, this next prospect is somebody that is very polarizing here in Carolina um, and, and really in NFL circles in general as far as, like, draft pundits and stuff go, right? It is a huge um, just disparity of opinion on Keon Coleman. I like him. He's my wide receiver four. <laughs> I've got Keon four, Xavier five. You've got him just a little bit switched. I believe you have Keon at six. Yep. Um, what do you like about Keon, man? Like other than the fact that he's a terrific rebounder, right? Like that's, yeah. that's the style that he plays, but there's more to Keon's game. In my opinion, what do you think? Without a doubt. I mean, to me, he's a, he's a good route runner. He's someone who can drop his weight well and come to a quick stop that you need to do on hard breaks, especially on timing routes in the middle of the mm-hmm. field. He gets open on timing routes. And so if you have as you brought up quite adeptly earlier, an anticipatory thrower, then, you know, if you're, if your main receiver, even if it's your first or second option gets open at the right time and you can find them, it'll work out. And I think that Coleman offers you that as an underneath guy, because he consistently earns that first step or second step of separation during the first 15 yards of a play. He just doesn't have the long speed like Xavier Worthy or anybody close to that in that spear to like pull away after 20 yards but inside 20 yards he'd give you a lot of volume in getting open on these underneath routes in the intermediate and short ranges of the field he's a good runner i joke that he's the garrett blunt of wide receivers the guy that kind of gets overlooked he's big they think he's a plotter they're you know they think he's what kelvin benjamin was you you know and they're gonna sit there and talk about kelvin benjamin but he's He's more dimensional than what Benjamin was. So you can yes. use him like Benjamin, but you can also use him as a complete player. And that, especially after the catch, he's very he, good. Yeah, he could be that red zone threat like you're alluding to with Kelvin, right? He can be that jump ball specialist. And that's where, if you are talking about his deep game, he can still win there. It's just going to be contested catches. And, and he's great with that. He's got extremely strong hands. He's physical. He does box out. You know, he's got a basketball background. So, I mean, a lot of that plays into the way that he goes up for the ball like that. Um, But I think that what you point to is really where I kind of fell in love with Coleman as a prospect was that intermediate. And when you see the movement of a guy his size on those punt returns that he had in college, and Michigan State used him uh, a, a bit differently than how Florida State did. Florida State tape was a little bit more rough to watch because that offense just wasn't super fluid in its own. And when you're sitting there trying to say that Michigan State's offense looked prettier than another one, that's pretty weird anyways, right? Like that's already like this like uh, twilight zone type of thing that I'm talking about. But Coleman just showed that he had a lot more to him than than the 4640. Here in Carolina, we do have a little bit of that PTSD with Kelvin Benjamin. So that that helmet scouting is something that I think a lot of fans have done. Um, But I'm glad that you bring him up and say that there are some positives with the way that Kelvin could be used too, though. And that Keon has those same positives. He just has a much bigger scope of football, I think, in his umbrella. Um, So the next guy, man, that I wanted to talk to you about, you're not low, you're not high. He's kind of like middling for you. 
I'm ridiculously high on him. Now, luckily for me, lately some national coverage for him has kind of caught up a bit. In fact, all the way up to today, where Peter Schrager released his uh, first mock draft, where it's all based on conversations with NFL coaches and GMs. So it's he's trying to give it as more of a little bit more of like an uh, inside perspective, if you will, on what he thinks is happening. Jalen Polk, man, I'm just a huge fan. And, and I'll give you my plain reason, my little elevator pitch, if you will. Um, he just catches the ball, man, and he's really damn good at it. Uh, he's got super strong hands. I like the ball skills. I think that he has plenty of versatility for me um, personally. I don't think that necessarily means that he's going to be the best at every single alignment, but I think he can play from them all and he can win at them. I still think that there's a lot of room to grow for him. Um, everyone always says they want the next Puka Nakua, right? I think what they say when they, or what they mean when they say that, they just want someone gem from the fifth round so they don't have to waste a first round pick on a, on a star. Yeah. But if you really like Puka Nakua's game and versatility and what he brings, Jalen Polk has a little bit of that for me when I watch him play. Um, what do you think Jalen Polk, and, and your comparison is what really caught my eye and why I even wanted to talk about him. You got CD over there at like that highest level, right? Right. What does he have to improve upon to reach that kind of ceiling? Man-to-man route running. He's going to have mm-hmm. to win against tight man coverage off the line um, and prove that he can do that. He's decent against off coverage. Um, and he has the speed to do that. Um, but I would say he's he doesn't quite have the craft yet to really shake up tight man coverage, especially against primary corners. So he's CD can play every three, all three positions at a high level. Whereas I would say Jalen Polk is probably better as a flanker or a a slot player who can give you, you know, that skill inside out and win Mm -hmm. the ball against a trailing defender where you can get separation. I'm laughing at the graphic with him because really his game is very strong at the catch point. And right. I would argue that this is one of the few plays you'd actually see where you'd see him leaning back to catch a ball like yeah. that. You'd actually see him more going straight up and down, yep. which is what you want to see. Cause you don't want to be opening your body to the defender. Yep. Now, I, again, I don't remember this play specifically, but the way it's, it's shaped. Yeah. Out this the, was, this was like a scramble play from uh Penix was scrambling a yeah. little bit and it was kind of a create out of, out of structure yeah. type of deal. And, and Penix threw it a little bit too high and, and yeah. Polk just kind of got all the way horizontal. Yeah. I but, only bring it up. And the reason I put it on this graphic, I actually yeah. was deliberate with that is the toughness and the yeah. attitude that he has. The dude is pretty fearless, man. Like he, he will go up for anything. He'll go up strong for it. And he doesn't really worry about anything that happens after catching that ball. His yeah, mentality I, is get the ball and then physical after it. Yeah. And if you give him a spread offense where he's a slot option, like I said, to work uh-huh. inside out on the boundary and win inside off play action, he could give an impact. He can make an impact for you right now. I see him as kind of gotcha. like, I, I joke a lot as like middle, lower class or like a, today, I think I right. gave a comparison to a player that he was the big lots version of a player, you know? Um, <laughs> yeah. And I'd say that he's kind of, a, he's aspiring to be a middle-class CD land, which is okay. not bad at all. Not you know, that's thing. a, yeah. that's a plus plus version of Marquez Calloway, who, right. you know, y'all know from Tennessee and from new Orleans. So, Orleans, right. yeah. So, you know, I think he just has to learn how to develop that patience and suddenness to really bait defenders with his routes, but he has great timing for back shoulder targets and he's good after the catch so he could make an impact as a player you know in certain sets right now right um and then his game has potential to grow some more into more of a primary you know maybe not a primary sure starter but your number two receiver or you're on the field all the time number three and I think people sometimes get too caught up in the whole wide receiver one thing, man. In the NFL, wide receiver twos and threes can put up really good production and be really important players to an offensive system. So I have no problem bringing in a guy like Polk and him being a high-end wide receiver two. Um, so the next guy that I want to talk about, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on real quickly some other names that you were higher on because I was surprised on some of these guys that you really liked. Um, you had Roman Wilson was pretty high for you if i remember that correctly uh i'd say oh, no wait wait, wait, wait. 
You yeah. had Ricky Pearsall. Ricky Pearsall is yeah. what I was thinking. You yeah, had him in the top go. 10. Um, Malik Washington cracked your top 15. Yep. And Jermaine Burton cracked your top 10. That was the guy that I think that I was the most surprised about was Jermaine yeah. Burton. Yeah. Um, I like him a lot on the field. I've got questions with Carolina as far as are they have any interest of taking a guy that has any kind of like red flag character off field, whatever it may be. We're trying to build a culture down here, and I just don't know that Dan Morgan's yeah. going to say, yeah, bring a guy that has some coaching issues. You know, like that would be right. fun. Um, but the guy that I loved seeing you very high on is a guy that I've been touting since probably like December. And it's because I watched him play with his teammate as a Carolina fan, Moose Muhammad III, Anaya Smith. Man, I love this little dude. I think that he is just a ball player. And he's got a lot of versatility that he can bring with the special teams aspect. I think he can come in right away and be your punt returner. And with these new kickoff rules, man, there may be more use for some of these special team type of uh, specialists, if you will. But Anais also plays the wide receiver position pretty well for a guy that just converted from running back. What is it about Anais Smith that had you so high on him? Because I believe you had him like 12th? Yeah, or 11th, actually. 11th, that's right. Yeah. So I have him as a guy that if you, if you, if the comp, if the depth chart is right and the scheme is a good fit, he could start for you immediately and, mm. d- and deliver in a large role. Because when you watch him, he reminds me of the player at the top of the list of uh, comparisons, Golden Tate. Both were running backs, fairly touted at good schools for, mm-hmm. for that position. And, it, you found that, yeah, you know what? They're not great between the tackles. They're okay, but they're not great there. We got somebody better in that role, but they're great in open space and on outside runs. You know, yeah. and let's put them a wide receiver. And next thing you know, you're looking at them and you're going, "Guy catches the ball like he's been playing wide receiver all his life." I mean, the technique yeah. is tight. You want the hands to be tight at the attack point. If they're far apart or far enough apart that they have to clap on the ball, now you're creating issues to fight the ball, and that leads to um, harder recoils and and juggles and just straight-out drops. Mm -hmm. So he's very good and tight with his hands in a variety of catch situations, both against contact and well away from his frame or both. Then you look at the route running, and and it's the same thing. You look at the route running, you're like, okay, this guy understands how to tell an efficient story. A lot of guys who played quarterback and they moved to slot – you see them at the senior bowl and people get all excited about them in one-on-ones because they do all this great, you know, all these great moves that are very yeah. playground oriented. And they're just and from a timing perspective, you know, he's gonna get yelled at by Bryce Young because it's like my third step just hit the ground and I need that ball to come out and <laughs> yeah. you're dancing, buddy. Right. Like, you know, we don't right. need that. You know, so you know, um, I'm trying to think of the name of the kid who's with Andy Isabella. And he's oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. a perfect yep. example of that player who was mm-hmm. just like dance fever when it came yep. to that kind of work. And then well, people love the workout videos because because he was shaking all yeah. over the place. Yeah. Yeah. Or Braxton Miller before that. You know, uh-huh. they were the one and the same. So when you look at Anaya Smith, what you see is a someone who's efficient in how he tells the story and how he misleads defenders. And there's a lot of good techniques to his game. So I think he's a more advanced version of what we saw from Curtis Samuel coming out right now. And I think he could grow into that Golden Tate role where you can use him deep occasionally as a flanker and put him outside. Mm -hmm. But he's going to do a lot of damage for you inside as a slot who can work deep on on you and also can use out of the backfield occasionally to draw matchups against linebackers and just beat the you know, beat the jersey off those guys right. you know on different types of routes like whip routes and texas routes and stuff like that where you know the quickness speed and sharpness of route running and the toughness to get downhill right. he, he might be the best runner after the catch there's maybe two or three guys that could be in the same tier with him but mm-hmm. he's up there like that and those comps are interesting too and it kind of caught my attention for why i wanted to talk about him here for like a panthers podcast right is golden tate might be some familiarity there. Canales may see something that kind of like strikes up a little bit of fond memories there. Um, but then Curtis Samuel's a guy that a lot of Panthers fans were even saying, hey, look, let's bring him back this year, right? Like he's a free agent. We need a separator. We need a creator. We need a, a yards after catch kind of guy. Like maybe we bring him in. So a guy like Anaya Smith to me is super appealing. I don't know where he goes in the draft. He's been dealing with some injuries um, in the pre-draft process. 
So I don't know where his value drops to, but man, if he was there in that, we've got back-to-back picks at 141 and 142. If he's sitting there, I wouldn't shy away from that. I think that that's a yeah. fair enough value. I think he's going to be an undrafted free agent because mm. because off the field, he had an arrest that right. included three things all at once. It was the, the, the ones that were least concerning were the pot possession and the gun possession without a, a license. I think in right. the South, we can all say that that can be taken care of easily. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> and then, and then this, and marijuana is becoming a non-issue right. more and more. Um, the DWI that he had is mm-hmm. the one he's going to really have to it's the decision-making. Yeah. They're going to have to see whether or not they believe he's matured from that right. and whether there were, there's more, there's some fire to that smoke. And if there isn't, yeah. then they may draft him late and say, yeah. well, you know, here, but they are, if they're not sure, it's a UDFA wait situation. Let's yeah. wait and see. And he'll do well in camp, but let's see if he can keep it together. That's a good point. That's a great point. Um, all right. So, real quick, let's just finish up with a on, finish up on the receivers here. Is there a guy that we didn't talk about that you're just like really, really into? into no matter where he ends up from a fantasy perspective, you just think this guy is a winner and he's going to produce? Obviously, the top three. It's tough to like. Yeah, we will the conversation. We'll, yeah, we'll take the top three out of the conversation. Yeah. You know, we touched on Ricky Pearsall and Jermaine Burton uh-huh. already, and you know, there's. But I would say after that, we'll go with another slot guy, and that's Malik Washington with yeah. um, UVA and Northwestern. And yep. he reminds me a little bit of a Santana Moss, aspiring kind of Santana Ooh, Moss type yeah. of player, maybe not quite that good. But if we remember Jacksonville way back in the day, they had a short spark plug by the name of Mike Thomas, I who do. was pretty good. I think he's a more advanced version of that. So you're looking that's at a good. player who can go up and win the ball, against tight man coverage. He can separate outside some against guys, especially if you put him at flanker. He's one of the best after the catch. Um, He's an efficient runner. He's a good route runner, just versatile and sound. And I wouldn't be surprised if he becomes a starter. Um, Smart kid, just, you know, you can use him in in the return game. You can use him as a scat back. You can use him as 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 a slot or a flanker. And that just gives you a lot of chances to show your worth. I like that. The Panthers met with him too. So that's a, that's a nice one for me. Let's get into some running backs, man. This is my guy right here. I love Kimani Vidal. Um, I I think that what I saw, so I I didn't really get into him on my own either. It kind of took like some clips and some people mentioning his name for me to be like, wait, I, I might need to actually go and watch this. Right. Because not a lot of times do I start my study off with like Troy prospects. Right. That's, right. that's usually not where I begin. Um, Kimani Vidal, I like him. And I, I think that when I look at what the Panthers need, we need a home run threat. We need a guy that can take it the distance. We need a guy that can be trusted on third down, that can make plays out of the backfield. But A, could be trusted to be in there and pass protect for Bryce Young because that's something that Miles Sanders and Chuba Hubbard have had some difficulties with in their career. Um, what do you like about Kamani? Because you have him, I believe, ranked sixth. Sixth, yeah. Yeah. And I've got him eight. So we're not far off there. Um, I think I was just a little gung shy to to really say it with my chest, you know. <laughs> uh, understandable. I just follow a process. And one of the things I yeah. like about doing with my my process is the pre-draft is like, look, I'm gonna put it out there. I had Isaiah Crowell number one the year that he was an undrafted <laughs> free agent, you know. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes that works, and then sometimes I'm different where it doesn't. Like Trace. Well, I remember looking at your quarterback thing one. that we were talking about earlier where you had the three years of quarterbacks. And the yeah. number one ranked guy up there, I believe, was Skylar Thompson. And you had yeah. an asterisk next to him and said it might have been a grading anomaly. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, I liked him. But yeah, yeah. it's exactly, you know, and sometimes but, that happens. And sometimes that happens. You know, that's the way you look at it because you, if you're process oriented, you're trying right. to get better and your true north is trying to do what you do. So I have the process and failures. Way, right? yeah. And yeah, I've been doing it 19 years. So it's working. So yep. it just, it's just you're going to have your you're going to have your bad days and bad years with certain players. So sure. Kada- Monty Vidal, I looked at him. I was watching Gunnar Watson, the quarterback out of Troy, and this kid just kept popping out in terms of on the film. You could see that mm-hmm. he, you know, good low center of gravity, the ability to break tackles, but also really strong movement. He was an efficient mover. He understood when to bounce plays outside, but also when to stick with the game plan. So I knew that he had he was a good decision maker between the tackles, and that mm-hmm. was important. And like you you highlighted the pass protection, you, you know, 
more advanced types of stunts and certain blitz disguises kind of follow him up a little bit, but that's to right. be expected with a kid playing at Troy. The fact right. that he can punch, get his hips low, that he can deliver a strike and stay with guys who are even bigger than him, even up to some linemen within a level of expectation. Sure. I'm not expecting Maurice Jones drew type blocking against right. you know NFL linemen that we've of seen course, in the past. or something like that charging yeah. at him. Yeah. yeah, it ain't happening. Okay. Right. But but he will give Bryce Young at least a step to get out of the way. That's and right. that's all you can really expect from a running back. And a lot of running backs don't do that. So yeah. when I look at him, I you know, you see DeAndre Swift there. I mm -hmm. looked at DeAndre Swift to me is kind of like that back that can give you strong production in the right scheme, but he's not a complete back, if you ask me. He's not a complete inside runner. He's more of a Mr. Outside, Mr. Space. And if you can pair him with a quarterback who's a real threat to run like Jalen Hurts, yeah. then you get the box advantage where you can run inside because you're basically running in open space yep. when three people are trying to take on Hertz outside right. on the zone read. So Kamani Vidal to me is how people who don't understand that about DeAndre Swift actually see DeAndre Swift. Like they see him as yeah. that kind of guy. What they're yeah. really looking at is what Kamani Vidal could become if he gets drafted high enough to get the opportunity to truly compete. Because as we know, James Robinson need at at um with the Jaguars, Excellent. actually yep. needed Doug Marone to ask permission from his staff. So I got this kid with no draft capital, who's a UDFA. Can you? Can I let him compete for a role on this depth chart? Um, I know we got Fournette, and they're like, "Yeah, we're trying to get rid of Fournette's contract anyway." So this is perfect. <laughs> Bring him on now, in. But the fact that you have to do that if Vidal's drafted low, because teams again they. Draft capital isn't a predictor of talent, in my opinion. It's a it's really a predictor of how safe they're going to look to their owner or the owner is to the media by saying, how do I cover my assets? And like, because that's how I got into this game. I want to bring this up real quick is yeah. I my the first reason I got into doing the RSP is I was writing about fantasy and football in general. And I read Gil Brandt and he was doing around this time back in 2004, 2005, I think it's 2005, maybe. And he said, there's this running back out of Villanova who had two ACL tears, one before he even got a chance to go to college. He had a scholarship at Florida State, and they rescinded the scholarship. Then he went to Villanova and tore it up early on, and he slipped on some black ice. Um, or he was that he slipped on black ice the first time. He played basketball, and he, and he tore another ACL. Um, and then he came back and played some more. He went to the Senior Bowl, looked great. Andy Reid really liked him. And Gil Brandt was like, if Brian Westbrook were just like a couple inches taller and 10 <laughs> pounds heavier, he'd be a top five overall pick. And that to me was like, oh, I get it. This is the corporate game. Really what you're 100%. telling me is if he failed and you drafted him as a top five player, you're getting fired. You're because chopped. Yep. You're chopped. But if you draft him in the second or third or fourth round, then you're like, you can say, well, it didn't work out, but what did you expect? You low know, risk, right? Small school, low risk. Yeah. So Vidal's kind of in that camp and probably mm -hmm. a lower round pick as a result. And so he's he's a good value in that way. But I like, I don't look at the draft cap because I'm not trying right. to predict where they go. I'm just trying to tell you if I think they're good and where they can be good or where they can't be, where they struggle and where it may be hard for them to get better. That's why I appreciate it so much, to be completely honest, man. It's just a, is is this a good football player? And what makes him yeah. a good football player? And that's, I mean, honestly, that's the way an evaluation should be. I do understand the draft capital things from the yeah, standpoint of a team, me too. right? These are people trying to save their jobs and, 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 and make informed decisions. I get it all. Yeah. But for the sake of people like me that just like to look at, you know, prospects and get into the fun part of that. I like that. And I love the way that you described the DeAndre Swift thing, though, because we saw all that come to fruition, right? We saw what he did in Detroit and where he had deficiencies in Detroit. Then you saw what his game looked like behind that offensive line and in that scheme and with Jalen Hurts. And it was almost like people were like, see, I told you DeAndre Swift was great. It's like, are you sure? Because you also yeah. told me Miles Sanders was great. And he came here to Carolina and it wasn't a pretty picture. Um, yeah. Which I'm not out on Miles Sanders completely. I think that there's yeah. some value there with him, too. Sure. The offense last year in Carolina was just anemic, but 
let me not get too into that. We could talk for four days about the Panthers' yeah. offense. Speaking of Iron Rich, you know. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> um, here we go. Jonathan Brooks. This is my running back one, um, just like you. And I've seen a lot of people that have Trey Benson running back one, and I, I don't disagree with that like notion that he could be looked at in that way. I like Trey Benson a lot, too. Jonathan Brooks is a little bit tough because you got to look at it and say he's probably not going to give you much next year, right? So you can sit there and you can say that he's the best running back in this draft class, but it's going to take some time before you actually see the fruits of that selection. Um, what is it about Jonathan Brooks that stood out to you? Well, look, you know, Trey Benson, I, I, th I think you highlighted that well. Trey Benson could easily be the most productive rookie in this class. I think there's about 10 players that could have that statement depending on where they land. But Benson would be one of the smart bets because he's a very good gap runner who can run behind. And they're running a lot of gap these days against smaller defenses where mm -hmm. you get power, counter, toss. You know, And I always joke that those are the fill-in-the-blank style um, decision-making for running back. It's like, yeah. meet, you know the you know you know don't think meat just give it the gas this is the whole yeah. hit that thing yeah. you know right and and that's fine you don't have to be a great decision maker for that but with zone you do he's going to get better at zone i think there's promise there but he's not quite there yet um so you look at that and you say that's fine but when you look at jonathan brooks you can put him in any system and i think he's going to do the job for you at a high level he's also the best pass protector in this class if you ask me absolutely he's, yeah i mean very rarely do you see running backs stay upright where they keep their head and eyes up when they strike mm. and str actually strike, delivering a punch with their hands tightened inside. You see all sorts of variations that's not that, and he does that very well, and even against linemen. So when you're doing that, you're 216 pounds, and you're doing this against linemen and slowing them down for at least one to two steps, yeah, you know, because that's, that's all you're – that's right. huge. So. Yeah. He's also, and he's very good at diagnosing. So on top of that, he's smooth, he's powerful. He's, you know, if we talked about what people saw in, in, in um, DeAndre Swift and it was Kamani Vidal, I'd say what people had that fever dream about Melvin Gordon out of Wisconsin years ago yep. is actually what Jonathan Brooks is. And maybe he's more of what, uh, you know, what we Southerners probably remember about Cadillac Williams before he went to the NFL. Hell yeah. He's more that just smooth, high processing, more powerful than you expect, make you miss in a phone booth, you know, runner who can do it all. And one of my favorite running backs in college, yeah. man. I loved watching Cadillac. Me, me too. Me too. And so, you know, Brooks to me that he gave me that vibe. And I think that, you know, I scout for nobody, you know, in terms of a team. So I'm not looking at scheme. You know, if I were looking at scheme specific things, there there would be a good example of why maybe Jameer Jameer Gibbs last year. If I look at my three years of rankings, Jameer Gibbs right. would have been a better pick for a lot of teams. But for teams that I'm looking for a between the tackles runner who can carry it a little bit more, but also give you some of that receiving skill and yep. pass protection on top of that, Jonathan Brooks was my number two back because I'm looking at the broader range. That's more um, scheme agnostic compared yep. to, uh, you know, people who are like a Detroit Lions and going, we need what we thought we were going to get from DeAndre Swift. Right, you right. know, I'm looking at it and going, I want to give you, I think I'm looking at a player who can give you even a broader range with great depth. And to me, Brooks was that player. Absolutely. I agree with that 100%. That's a great way to put all that. I mean, the way that you could put perspective on all of these things and really like make me understand it. I appreciate this conversation. Like I love reading the RSP, but this conversation, man, like it's visually happening when I'm hearing you talk about some of these players and stuff. It's just really starting to connect. Look, well, that's cool. This is a this is a podcast. So like everyone else is listening is going to end up listening to this episode. But I'm gonna tell you now, it's already a home run for me. I've enjoyed the hell out of this oh, already. Man. I'm glad I'm having fun. This is good. So look, this next guy, I have him as running back seven. Where did you have Will Shipley? Same place. Oh, you had him seven too? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Same place. Locally, that's going to go over really well because there are a lot of fans that, man, the Carolina Panthers have never drafted a, a Clemson Tiger. We have not done it in the history of the franchise. 
I think Will Shipley could be a really nice person to break that streak for the Panthers. You talk about needing a pass catcher out of the backfield. Um, that's Will Shipley, right? A lot of people want to call him the poor man's Christian McCaffrey. I don't know if you would refer to him as the big lots Christian McCaffrey. You can if you want to. It's not going to offend me. <laughs> right. um, so what do you like about Will and why did you have him as your seventh best in this class? Well, I mean, I think he's the best receiver um, in terms of, you know, route running and pass catching combined. You know, yeah. there's three backs three backs in this class who are all kind of in the same tier for me who have a similar archetype and Shipley's the highest of the three, mainly because I think his receiving skills and his smarts as an interior runner and athletic ability overall, give him a chance to become a player who can be a viable contributor early and someone who can be versatile enough that you could get eight to 12 touches per game to him mm -hmm. and he can yeah. produce on a regular basis. I think he's, you know, I, when you look at Clemson and look at their running backs in recent years, when they had a strong quarterback and the team was playing at, at the highest levels that it has been playing with in recent peak years, you could look at those running backs and say, maybe they were a little overrated. They were certainly NFL caliber players mm -hmm. and starter caliber players, but the system that they were in didn't ask a lot of them as decision makers between the tackles. It was more of a gap style, hit it fast, be the athlete. And then they had to adjust a little bit more to their game. I think Travis Etienne was a guy that you knew, Etienne, you knew that he could develop and could get better. And he did last year. He you did, really yeah, saw the year, bad yeah. level was like, I was so happy for him yep. to show that he could run it tough like that. Cause you saw, moments of that later in his career like right. as a junior and a senior but pretty for, sporadic though yes and and the decision making still was like you could tell it was like he was going to have moments in the nfl where they're going to say look you got to fix that and he right. did um i think shipley is kind of the inverse of that where now that they didn't really have the quarterback play on the level that they had in the past the offense didn't play as well and so he, maybe he had to deal with more difficult situations where the skills shine through if you're really studying the right criteria, but from a results oriented process, it wasn't as easy to see. And that's generally, you know, the highlights weren't as strong for what people would have seen with say at the ETN yep. compared to Shipley. So I think right. Shipley's better than people realize. And I think at the low end of the spectrum, if you look at Louisville, former Louisville back in New York, Jeff Bilal Powell, he was a mm -hmm. do everything guy. Not really yep. big, but he could run with more pop than you realize. Mm -hmm. He got up to about 215 pounds. He had some enough speed to get into the secondary, and maybe he wasn't a burner, but he could flip the field on you if if he hit a hit a crease well where there was you know was blocked up well and the blitz was coming. You know, yep. good pass catcher, good pass protector, and played a long time in this league. Now if Shipley can continue to advance his game maybe add a little bit more muscle to his frame and maintain the explosion that he has. Maybe you're looking at an Austin Eckler type. Maybe that's something that we could see happen. I don't see him quite getting there, right. um, but I see the, like if I were to bet on it, I'd say no, but I'm open to the idea that it could happen. You could see that as a potential, like, Hey, look, if everything goes his way, if everything goes well, he goes to the right system. He has the right supporting cast, has the right quarterback, the right offensive mind. And he, he like that. And he can add the weight and show yep. that he can, he can play at the level at a heavier weight at the level mm -hmm. he is and not break and down. maintain the same athleticism and everything else. Yeah. Then I'm in on that, but that's yep. a lot of ifs for me to say, it is. you know, he's, he's, you know, I don't know. I don't know. He's, you know, I don't know which one is a better one for big lots, you know, but uh, <laughs> a grade up from big lots. I haven't thought of that one yet, but you know, he certainly, like he's not Walmart that much. superstore or something like yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> you know, exactly. You know, or maybe a, a Kirkland's or something like there that. You go. Yeah. You like know, Kirkland's. There we go. Yeah. He, maybe he's, maybe he's, or a target or a pier one, maybe, you know, I don't okay. know if he's pier hey, one yeah. yet, but yeah, pier one, that's there. a little bit, pier one could be a little, a little bougie. Uppity, you know? yeah, yeah, exactly. A little <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, but you know, um, he could, might be in Dick's sporting goods range. There you go. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. That's yeah. a perfect one. Yeah. Um, all right. So from running back standpoint, then is there a guy that we didn't talk about that 
again, we, we're not going to be able to really give a, a, a very true predictive look at where these guys could have success in their rookie season because we don't know where they're playing in their rookie season. Um, but is there a guy that you think, look, man, wherever he goes, I think he's going to earn his shot and he's going to be productive in year one. Ooh, year one. I would say it's going to be one of two guys, um, okay. and they're in the same tier with Shipley, and that's Dylan Lobby of New Hampshire and yep. Blake Watson of Memphis through Old Dominion. Love um, Blake. Yeah, bl- I'm a Blake fan. I think they're a very similar style of backs. Dylan Lobby is m- the best at the vertical routes in terms of earning positioning to win one-on-one, and he's a very good runner who really sets up defenders well in the open field and can do enough between the tackles and might have enough of a build that to get a little bigger too. I don't think it's quite as guaranteed as maybe like Will Shipley, but sure. it's it's possible there. Watson to me is my favorite even though he's the lowest ranked of the three. They're all they're all so close together that I'm more looking at score. So right. for me you know, points. They were like a point. a point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like less a point than a away point from each other. Them. Yeah. It's just how the combination of how he scored things work. Right. So when I look at Whit- Watson, he had the best hands of the three. He does not fight targets. He has great hand eye coordination. Maybe he doesn't have the route sophistication of Shipley, nor the ability to win downfield with positioning just yet that Lobby does. But I think he's a more powerful runner than those two. Um, he's a good pass protector. He's a smart runner, and he's the fastest of the three. Yep. I would, uh, on top of that, or arguably as fast as Shipley is, and it shows on the field as well, if not a little better than than what Will could provide on tape, at least from what we can determine. Um, right. So those three guys, right away, I think Lobby and Watson probably the ones that could make the impact right away because of the types of roles that they could have. There's yep. one other guy that I don't think he'll make the impact right away, but I think for any team, you'd be if if the injuries don't worry you. Um, I think Dylan uh, Johnson yeah. of UW, he's a fave of mine. He's a he's you one of those to, tough guys. You got him at running back five, right? Yeah, I do. He's a he's in that Spencer Ware. Alec Collins, Alex Collins kind of mold where it's like yeah. he's going to break a lot of tackles. He runs hard. He's got enough quickness, even if he didn't run fast. And he's a pass receiver. I mean, he, he got recruited by Mike Leach. Yeah. I mean, people get yeah. so nervous about the athletic testing, man. Um, and it's, it's what like Bucky Irving is a really polarizing back because like he's got this like he's got dynamic to his game, right? He can make people miss. He's shifty. But like his athletic testing was really, really bad. And when you look at it and then his size and his build, a lot of people are very concerned about Bucky. And I, I believe you had him all the way down at like 20. Yeah. Um, I think for that's me, it was a little different. Being. Yeah, for me, it's a little different because he fights the ball. And if you're mm-hmm. going to try and get a, be a pass, if you're going to you're going to be a yeah. pass catching back who fights the ball and his positioning isn't all that great against zone coverage at certain times. He's drifts mm-hmm. too much. There's things to work on. But like your point really more than anything i think that to expand upon is that when you're a smaller back and you're slower um, or your athletic ability is an issue and you have decent size you're looking for compensatory factors that can that are good enough like devin singletary to me is probably the outlier version of a player with compensatory factors like Mm -hmm. he's short he's small he's slow um (laughs) he's not extremely quick but he processes really fast and he has great decision-making and he runs Mm -hmm. hard with good pad level. And he was that guy who could overcome enough with decision-making to be a competent contributor who can sometimes start for you or be used in that role, at least as a bridge journeyman type. And I think that, you know, I just don't think, I don't think uh, Bucky Irving is going to be quite that, but I didn't think Devin Singletary would be either. So we'll see if we can make it two in a row. I'd bet against, Singletary is probably every time, even if right, you root for right. them to succeed, you know, because you're going to end up on top usually with those odds, right? Like you, like you said, it's an outlier type of situation. So somebody has to do something that normally isn't done in order to succeed from some of those positions. Um, real quick, we're going to move on to tight end, but I do want to just say the name George Halani because I'm a big George Halani guy. Look you are, you. and and man, you're one of the only people that I saw talking about him. Um, I got a, a buddy who is, who's been on the show, Edgar Salmingo Jr. Um, yeah. and he was actually Halani's, uh, vice principal in high school. 
So we have had many discussions about George um, and and really have just a lot of respect for his game and the and the adversity that he's overcome with the injuries and things like that. And from what Edgar has told me, that the personal side of Holani is just as impressive as the physical on the field too. So George That's Holani, awesome. wherever he ends up, I think he could be a good ball player too. For sure, I think special teams is going to be where he starts off. Yep. Um, but he's a good pass catcher, very good mover. And yep. I think his game's grown over the past three years, and he's someone that has good power um, in terms of contact bounce, especially in the open field. And yep. so, to me, he could wind up a plus version of Jeff Wilson. Um, right now, I would say he's not that far away from him. You know, yeah. he just has to develop a little bit of understanding of the types of defenses he's facing and the nuances of the NFL game to, to be able to get an opportunity. I like that one a lot. So, tight ends. This is my guy. Ben Sinnott. I'm telling you, man, I am a big time Ben Sinnott guy. I think that if Brock Bowers was not in this class, I would be screaming for the Panthers to take Ben Sinnott at 33. And I'm I'm going to tell you another thing, man. I still think that there's value wherever he goes. I think he's going to be able to reach that value. Um, I, I, I'm not saying that he's going to be a top 10 pick, but if he's a second, third, fourth round pick any anywhere in that range, and that's a large range of selections, I think that he can fulfill that value, though. Because he offers a lot in the way of his game. It's not one note. Um, he's not the best inline blocker. That was my biggest knock that I had on him. Um, but the way that he's used um, from an alignment versatility standpoint, you're not necessarily needing him to be the best inline blocker. Um, he's got really good hands. He's still kind of, I feel like he's still scratching that tip of the iceberg of the tight end position. I mean, he's a guy that played fullback, H-back. You know what I mean? Like, he, he wasn't asked to do all of these things that he showed he can do until the last like tail end of his college career. I think that when he gets to the league, he's a guy that can immediately make an impact, whether it's on special teams, whether it's as a pass catcher, whether it's as, you know, in the backfield as an H back. Um, what you have, you have been as well as your tight end too. What were the selling points that you think make him a, not only viable fantasy player, but a really good NFL player? I mean, He's not an inline blocker on the level of what you're expecting inline blockers to do. Mm -hmm. But what you would expect him to do is that second option um, in line he can do. You know, mm -hmm. he can do double teams. He yep. can do some cutoff blocks. He can do some backside work. He's gonna. He's a tough blocker who does some things technically sound. He just doesn't have the great size that you're, length, but you're not yeah. looking for that from him. Yeah, or the great length. But you know, the versatility to play fullback, that H-back role, to be split outside, great contact balance as a runner, mm -hmm. skill as a route runner. I mean, he can yeah. drop his weight. He can come to those quick stops. He can tell stories. He can be that intermediate route runner. To me, there's two ways of looking at him. We can do the, the local way first would be he's everything that I remember people talking Tommy Tremble was supposed to be. But I never really understood. You know, I hope Tommy works out on a big level. But sure. I saw Tommy as more of a special teams guy than I saw him as like a legitimate top end receiver mm -hmm. who can give you more than check down types of sc and screen plays in the open right. field. I think Ben Sinot Ben Sano can give you the intermediate routes in addition to the schemed up plays to get him in the space. So I think he's more of what people were hoping that Tremble might develop into, but yep. wasn't going to get there. And then I also look at it as more nationally. I spent three years listening to people talk about the Michael Mayer. And Michael Mayer is a quality football prospect. Yep. But I think I would have transferred all that buzz that I started hearing about Mayer. And if I hear buzz about a player, it's got to be deafening because I try not, I don't watch a lot of college football. On, I, I may watch a bowl game on tv otherwise i'm watching a lot of all 22 i'm not listening to any of the narratives it's just you know i don't know that stuff usually sure so if i hear michael mayer's like the next coming of tight end god for three loud. years it's loud and yeah. I, I i kept hearing that and going we could have taken like about two-thirds of that and just put it on to on to um you know, Benson, Benson, oh, and it would have evened out where, you know, mayor wasn't overhyped and Sano wasn't some unknown. Right. And I think it right. would have been balanced the scales for what their football abilities were. Yeah, that's, yeah, I agree with that. And I, I think that 
So for me, too, with the Tommy Tremble thing, you made a really great point. Tommy can handle those check downs and those those like real quick, just dish it off. You're not asking him to be a route runner. You're not asking him to create his separation. And you're not banking on him to have these sure hands with these deep passes. We saw drop passes from Tommy last year. But what you see with him, and it does kind of translate with Ben, the athleticism with the with the ball in his hands, he can be a dynamic yards after the catch kind of guy. Uh, we've seen Tommy hurdle multiple defenders. We've seen Ben do it a couple times. Like the athleticism and the explosiveness is there, but Ben is just that more complete three level route runner kind of pass catching threat right away. Um, and he can develop into an even better version of that, I think. Um, so Ben Sinat is the guy, or is it Sanat? Is it Sano? I, is there any confirmation on his name? I, you know, I should check. And but it's yeah, I should have worst too. areas where I usually am is that because I'm just spending time looking at the player a lot. I'm yeah. not looking at the pronunciation but i think most people say so no okay well then let me get better about that um so tavion sanders this is another guy that with the athletic testing there are thresholds right that are going all around social media thresholds for tight ends with athletic testing and the res score and all those things that if you're below those thresholds it is very difficult to project them into being an elite or high level tight end in the nfl Sanders is well below those thresholds when it comes to the RES. Um, what is it about Sanders that you feel relatively comfortable about? Because you have him as tight end four. Yeah, I mean, I guess for me, I look at, I guess the threshold it has to be his size, you know, mm -hmm. more than anything. Um, but we're seeing this position get smaller and smaller and people adopting to the move tight end. And I mean, it's not like he's slow. I mean, yeah. you know, this is not, you know, Rob Gronkowski is a good example. I mean, he was big and fast for his size, but I think sometimes we get a little too wrapped up in the size speed combo component, as opposed to understanding that we're not comparing Jatavian Sanders and Rob Gronkowski. They're two very different players. Rob mm -hmm. Gronkowski was one of the greatest inline blockers at the tight end position. And most of these guys aren't being used that way. It's why you can't compare Travis Kelsey and Rob Gronkowski or George Kittle with Travis Kelsey, you know, right. because they're different in terms of what they do. Sanders is more of a David and Joku type, a backside blocker, someone who you can use in the slot as a big slot receiver. And he's going to run routes for you off play action and get you get open in the middle of the field or in the flats catching the ball on the move, like over routes, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's the, that's really where you, you're going to see him eventually thrive screen game, things like that. Yeah. So, you know, it's going to take him a little bit of time, you, you know, weird when I heard an analyst call him a vertical threat from the tight end position, that was a strange one to me because I don't necessarily know that I've seen enough to think that he's like a vertical threat in the passing game. Is that, is that something that you see as part of his game? I think if you define people define vertical so differently, you mm -hmm. know, so if you say beyond 15 yards is vertical, then mm -hmm. sure, he can stretch the right. vertical seam. People will use that as a good example. Okay. Is he a vertical on the outside one on one against the defender who's going to win a go route? Absolutely not. He's not running right. deep posts on you. Um, and you don't need him a, to either, though, really. No. Right? He's yeah. an inside vertical threat. Maybe yeah. that's the best way to put it. It's like, yeah. yeah. So I think that's what he does well. And he's okay. good after the catch. So you, that's why you see Joe New Smith and David Njoku as comps. Yeah, I see the Joe New Smith, and that's interesting because that's actually somebody that I thought was similar to uh, Jaheim Bell, who also is a, is a player that's a little bit shorter. Um, the size is a little bit more of like a fullback, if you will. Um, yeah. But man, you get the ball in his hands, and he's just a, he's a bowling ball. He's an athlete. This is a guy I think that, is really an interesting player is Jared Wiley. Um, he's got that size at 6'6", 250, right? He's got great length, 33 and a quarter arms, um, vertical of 37, and he's not slow. But his usage at TCU didn't really give you a ton of idea about like, and, and Theo Johnson was in, in a way kind of similar because they both have these impressive athletic profiles and, and do show ability but they weren't asked to do a whole ton in, in their college career. What do you think about Jared Wiley and his prospects as a NFL tight end compared to what we saw at TCU? 
You know, a lot. this is a very popular archetype of receiver that you see the NFL draft after the fourth round. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I joke that they're like, like the Davis Allens and the um, Will Mallory's and the Luke Stalkers and goes on and on are tall guys who are high cut to an extent who aren't great, great blockers to be in line. They're not unbelievable after the catch, yeah. but they can win up the vertical seam and you can run them on sail routes to the boundary and run fades with them in the red zone and they can give you some of what Jimmy Graham gave at the at the peak of his career. Mm -hmm. Luke Wilson's a great example of that type of lesser version of that player who had yeah. a long career in the league. Um, and I think Jared Wiley, though, is the type of guy who could ex expand his game beyond that and actually be worth the draft day capital that's put into these types. Because I usually look at this and I go, I understand that tight ends are important and they can have value, but if they're not right. great blockers, you're only using them on a limited basis as a receiver. Right. This sounds like a hedge pick to me that, right. some, you right. know, more than anything else than it being a good pick. And I think yep. Wiley's a little bit better because he can work some underneath routes. You mm -hmm. can see some yards after the catch. He doesn't look as like a plodding power forward doing it. He's yeah, got some a little short area quickness, right? Yeah. Like a little bit. It's not like he's going to like blow past anybody and he's not going to do the, you know, can shake you in a phone booth type of stuff, but he can move a little bit in close quarters. Yeah. Yeah. So he can give you that underneath game and then double move you on the outside if you're mm -hmm. facing some off coverage against a certain linebacker or safety. So there's some potential there. So I like his game um, in terms of if you frame it from that perspective, which most of the players I mentioned as examples weren't guys that I would have wanted to draft in rounds five or six. I would right. prefer to have them as UDFAs. Right. And I brought him up, too, because, as you said, with the Jimmy Graham and the Luke Wilson. Those may be uh, players that, again, maybe Canales sees something with a Jared Wiley that may remind him a little bit of guys that he had in Seattle at times, you know, in, in the career where he says, hey, look, this helped Russell Wilson out, right? Like this was a guy that Russell felt comfortable with and went to. So I try to find some familiarity when I look at some of these prospects when looking for the Panthers. Um, Matt, I appreciate you coming on, man. That was just terrific information. Um, I would... If you ever are up to it again after the draft, I would love to have you on, man, and talk a little bit more about fantasy because we've got a lot of fantasy listeners, too. Um, I just didn't want to give, you know, halfway answers right now. I felt like it's usually a little bit better to do the uh, projections for fantasy once they're on a team and you have an idea of how they'd be used and what's around them. Sounds great to me, and I appreciate it. This was fun. Do this anytime, and um, you just give me a call or, you know, you know where to reach me, and yeah, I'll be glad to do it. So I appreciate cool. you. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, you're good. I was going to say we've got the graphic up here to kind of show anyone that's watching where to find you. But for anyone that's just listening, uh, let everybody know where they can find all your work, what you have going, um, because you've got a lot going on right now, man. Sh sure. If you want to just buy the book, if you're just one of those people that go, listen, I heard enough. I want to I want to see what this is about. You can go to mattwaldman.com. I have two sites because, look, I'm an old dude who started this, <laughs> and then I started this on a shoestring. I was working three jobs. This became my full-time living. But, you know, you're putting a kid through college, and then she dropped out and became a Marine, and then, you know, now she's going back to college. You know, she's living on her own and doing her thing, and she I'm very proud of her. She does a great job. But, you know, oh, yeah. you go from that kind of thing. You're like, okay, I got this WordPress thing. I started it off with this, and now I've got a sales site. Sales site's easy to go to, mattwaldman.com, and you know it's easy to get the book that way. If you want to see the content I do, previous scouting reports that I put up as samples of players, both players that I think were going to be good, players that I think that were going to struggle a little bit, you get the range of that. You can get it at mattwaldmanrsp.com. I'm probably most active on a daily basis at Matt Waldman on X, so if you can stomach Twitter or X or whatever you call it these days, I do a yeah. lot of video breakdowns. I'm not a big hot take artist there. I'm usually just generally either posting about my dog, posting funny things and picking on people in the industry who know I'm picking on them in a fun way <laughs> and they pick on me back. And then I just post straight up content fantasy and just video after video. You could probably just 
go search and pick a skill player and put at Matt Waldman next to it. And you'll find probably somewhere between three to 10 videos that I've done in preparation that'll pop up. And if you want to see bigger videos, longer videos in depth at Matt Waldman's RSP film room on, on YouTube. And I have all my podcasts are starting to go up there too, as well as all your podcast outlets. I do a variety of fantasy and reality type of podcasts on scouting you know, you've got me and Angelo, Brandon Angelo, who is a track and field athletic expert who's kind of works. He works with pro athletes and college athletes on helping develop them. And he was a former sprinter and a former running back at Purdue. We have a lot of enlightening conversations. He does great work and has his own site. You can learn more about that there, too. And things with like fantasy sports writer of the year, Adam Harstead, where we he looks at a lot of. Um, modeling statistical models and theories and we talk about film and the theory side of fantasy football and actual football because he's a really good historian of the mm-hmm. game and so we get into a lot of that and there's bob harris and i we do a quick hitting show called feel it or fuck it where we just basically talk mm-hmm. about quick topics and and go into that i watched that one last night and you had the uh bryce young talk on there and i was like man I don't know if Matt's just doing me a solid and setting me up to talk about Bryce because he had the Bryce and Deontay Johnson. That was all (laughs) Bob. That was all Bob on that one. Like this time of year, he asks, he comes up with the questions and I answer. And then in the fantasy season, I come up with the questions and let him. Oh, and then we both answer. But like, you know, we kind of switch off because he knows I'm a little busy during this time of year. So he well, for listeners, if you if you want to, you should go and check that episode out. The feel it or fuck it. That includes Bryce Young and the Deontay Johnson outlook. Um, I'll give you one spoiler. Matt doesn't shy away from Bryce Young there. Um, so if you're a Bryce Young and Panthers fan, go and listen to it, man. You're probably going to enjoy what he has to say about it. Um, Matt, I appreciate you, man. That was awesome. Um, and, and, and let's not forget to plug one more time, www.d2l.org. Yeah, um, that, is the, that is the website for the daylight or darkness to light um that combats sexual abuse for children yeah out of charleston uh, south carolina so so that's right man i us. saw that yeah. and you know i meant to ask you where where you're kind of from but you alluded to it a little bit that your wife is from north carolina so she sounds wonderful already congratulations yeah, she, on that she grew up in <laughs> moxville north carolina okay if you know where moxville was and I, I I, met i'm her familiar in, with the area I, I met her in winston-salem that's where she was living and i'm okay. north of atlanta so okay. i've been in atlanta since around 1980 before that Cleveland, so I'm a Cleveland Browns fan, whether I like it or not. And uh, but I, uh, but I've you know been the, I've been a Southerner since I was ten years old. So we're both just doing as much as we can to break the stereotype that all Southerners suck, right? <laughs> <laughs> there you have it. Exactly. You know, I think it's we we can go after some of those Northwesterners who uh, who think that they 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 think their shit doesn't smell. You know, I think yeah, that's kind of. The, uh, some of them, so I, I like the Northwest. It's a beautiful place. Yeah. And there's some beautiful people there, but there's some folks there that I'm going, dude, like, really? Like, you got to calm down a little bit. Like, let's take a little bit of the vitriol that we get thrown at us and let's just move it up a little bit, right? Like, I, not everything sucks down here, I, man. Like, you got man, some stupid shit up there, too. And, and you got to <laughs> laugh because, like, I was in Mobile for the Senior Bowl and we're riding around. I'm, I'm not going to tell you who the riders were, but they were both they were both from outside of the South. I'll put it that way. Right. Um, and not exclusively Northwest. And they were talking and I, and I just, I just kind of slowed the car down. I was driving. I was like, listen, <laughs> I was like, first of all, while I came from the North, I said, all the bad shit that I heard about Southerners, mm-hmm. I learned most of that stuff and had to unlearn it from the Northerners from the and North. had to unlearn it in the South. I mm-hmm. said, and there's, a, and yes, there's things that you can joke about and there's things that are serious issues, but they're all right. over the place. And I'll just tell you, you don't know what you're talking about. So you 100%. might want to, you might want to get yourself educated before you start walking around talking within earshot of people the way you are, uh-huh. because you, you know, if you were doing that up North, you'd probably get punched out. And you know, I've got Definitely. enough, I got enough Northerner in me that I, it still might happen. That so might happen too. Right? Out, yeah. You know? You're fortunate that down South, there's a Southern hospitality, right? Everyone tries to give you a little yeah. bit of grace down here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Bless your heart. They know, bless you know, heart. we, we know, we know what bless your heart means. They right. don't know what bless your heart means. We're just, yeah. we'll go back into the kitchen, make a tomato sandwich or some biscuits or something like that. We'll be okay. Yeah, you know, man. that works. Awesome. That works. Um, Matt Waldman, everybody. Thank you very much for being here. Appreciate it. 
effects and stuff. I had to bring that out for you at the very end, man. I'm trying real hard to be a professional outlet here. Um, all right. So with that, we're going to go ahead and we'll end the episode. Uh, this has been terrific. Stay tuned for next week. We're going to have some uh, new things going on for the NFL draft, and we'll have a couple more guests. Um, and until then, I am your host, Ricky Rains of The Bow Body Show. Thank you.